Hey, good morning, everybody. If you're here for AI for cybersecurity, uh, that's our panel for the next hour. We've got a great lineup of professionals, subject matter experts on artificial intelligence, AI for cybersecurity. My name, I'm the moderator. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm Harry Wingo. Harry's not descriptive at all. I'm with the National Defense University at Fort McNair. So you've probably heard of the National War College, uh, Eisenhower, which covers the economic or industrial or DIB part of things. I'm at the College of Information and Cyberspace. And for six years, I've had the honor of being full-time faculty uh, at the National Defense University's College of Information and Cyberspace. And we have graduate degrees waiting for anybody who wants to uh, do any number of ways that you can come through and get a graduate degree uh, in cyberspace and information with us. You can do it online over a couple years. Or you can come and see us for 14 weeks. Do it that way. Or we have a, a smaller cohort of about 60 at this point, but it's going to grow where you can stay for uh, 10 months. What we do is educate strategic leaders. So we're at the graduate level at the National Defense University. And so my background, I was born Army, Navy SEAL officer for six and a half years, a long time ago. Got out in the private sector, became a lawyer, uh, did a couple things, Federal Communications Commission, uh, Ning, you're, you're with DISA. Connectivity matters for AI as well. So communication networks, Senate Commerce Committee, under the late great uh, Senator Ted Stevens, uh, World War II aviator, uh, did that. Went to Google after being at a startup. A startup for two years, energy information for networks. So I do networks, I got the policy side of that. And I was a lobbyist at Google when the attacks out of China happened. Got to take the CEO over to the White House, explain cloud security from Google's perspective back then. Uh, did some other stuff, ran the D.C. Chamber of Commerce, so, you know, how does a city run? And I've been at the National Defense University for six years. So our panel, uh, amazing group of individuals dedicated uh, to cybersecurity in the private sector and in the government. And we'll start out with Randy Trezak. Randy's at Carnegie Mellon University, Software Engineering Institute. Great background on the uh, insider threat aspects, among other things. So, Randy, uh, thanks for being here. And all our panelists are going to, if you would, panelists, as we get started, just take a quick minute to say the things about your background that you want uh, to cover, and then we'll jump into our questions. Next, we have Jeff Worthington, uh, served the nation, including as uh, JSOC, J6, so basically for Spec Ops, the CIO. Uh, for that high speed part of what the nation does and uh, great background since then has been a crowd strike uh, for a couple of years now and, yep. and Jeff thanks for doing another version of this a year and a half ago so one of the things we want to cover is what's changed more recently seems like you get in the conversations about AI and chat GBT and grocery store lines now but what uh, Jeff has seen this develop as have all the panelists over some time and uh, Dr. Schaefer Joseph uh, it's my colleague. I've learned from him, including DevSecOps. I'm going to hold up a copy of the Phoenix Project at some point. Oh, thank you, Steve. <laughs> so I've learned from uh, Joseph, and jo Joseph is at the College of Information and Cyberspace, Army background, done a lot of great things, including being, I think, an electrical engineer and computer science. But, you know, so he actually knows what he's talking about on technical stuff. Thanks for being here. And Steve, fail. Steve was with Microsoft. And they say, whatever you can't stop thinking about, that's what you love. And for Steve, he was telling me he does AI for fun, right, in, on, in his own time. So I love that. But he's with Microsoft, and so Security Copilot, and what's happening with AI for cybersecurity, uh, we've got a great lineup. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to our panel. All right. So you guys trusted me on that. You gave them applause. You gave it up, even though they haven't earned it yet in your mind. <laughs> So that's how I want you to think about all this stuff on AI. And so to set the framework, why does it matter? That's the first thing we're going to cover. We're going to cover three things in the next hour. One, what is AI for cybersecurity? And what's the business purpose for it? Why? Two, you've got the people side. Workforce. What's it going to do for your workforce? Is it going to take them from zero to hero? Is it going to replace them? Hmm. And what's it do for your heroes already? And the galactic level in your organization, the leaders. What's it going to do for your C-suite or board level? What's AI for cybersecurity going to do uh, for agency heads or even higher up? And finally, ZT. 
Zero trust is a principle, but zero trust architectures. Why does that matter? So I want you to think about as a moderator before we jump in, think about time. I think that's one of the most important things that AI for cybersecurity is going to do. It's going to allow us to create dilemmas. As Secretary of Defense says, we want to create dilemmas for the adversary. The big picture, we're in great power competition. Nothing against the Chinese people or the Russian people, but Beijing, Xi, where they are is a pacing threat for us. We have to create dilemmas for our adversaries. We're in competition right now, but things are getting heated. We are in a decisive decade. Napoleon told his marshals, his uber generals, you can ask me for anything, horses, guns, money, but you can't ask me for what? Time. Can't ask me for time. And I held my boxing hat up, a martial artist. We know that we're combat arms of cyber now. But Conor McGregor, you guys know who, he, who that is? MMA fighter? So on the thing of time, I want you to think about something he said when he knocked somebody out in 13 seconds for a title fight. Won the championship in 13 seconds. His hand was held up. He hadn't even broken a sweat. Anybody know what he said? First he said, precision beats power. And then he said, and anticipation beats speed. All right. So let's get after it. Panel, just threw out there the first thing. What is AI for cybersecurity? Uh, anybody want to jump in on that first? Uh, okay, Randy, please. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as was introduced, Randy Trees at Carnegie Mellon University, the Software Engineering Institute. For those of you who aren't familiar with the SEI, we're a federally funded research and development center. So our focus in this area is really looking at the three to five to 10 years ahead in relation to how AI can support national defense including the sponsors for our FFRDC, which is the Department of Defense, United States federal government, as well as law enforcement. When we focus on AI, we're looking through our current study, which is a national initiative on cybersecurity advancement, of looking at how AI can support the defense of critical infrastructure with organizations, ways by which you can build resiliency into organizations to make your organizations better able to prevent, detect, and to automate that process of response. So a couple areas that we're looking to identify is ways by which artificial intelligence can assist the analysts in your organization, assist the analysts from the anomaly detection, supporting existing tools such as anomaly detection capabilities, SOAR type capabilities, or vulnerability detection and analysis. There's a lot of discussion that AI is going to replace analysts in your organization, we're under the hypothesis that that won't be for the foreseeable or eventually ever within organizations. So how can AI collect this vast amount of organizational knowledge and experience? Traditionally, the analysts and organizations had to have that institutional knowledge embedded into tools or technology. So our assumption is that AI can help support through this inst institutional knowledge ways by which we can identify common techniques, tactics, and protocols supporting threat hunters in your organizations. Make that speed by which the detection occurs uh, quicker, and you make that to the point where we can get closer to the boom, if at all possible, with an organization. So as we look at AI, we're looking for ways by which it can support the human in that defense paradigm, but also the ability to prevent, detect, and to respond. So that's generally how we're thinking about the problem. And certainly there's lots of challenges, and we're trying to identify some of those challenges to include ways by which we can help support the analysts and organizations, the automation, as well as ways by which we can use generative AI techniques and, and patent tactics to kind of anticipate what's coming, rather than historically where analysts have told the tools what to look for, have the tools help support the analysts in terms of ways by which that anomaly detection can occur. And, what, and when I was being introduced, insider threat is my area of expertise. I've been involved in that particular area as well ways by which we can put tools and techniques in place to identify individuals with authorized access deviating from presumed good or normal activity to identify insider threats within an organization. So I'd like to maybe leave that as my opening general statements about AI. Awesome. And also I made a mistake. I jumped right into the first thing before going through the rest of the brief introductions. So Jeff, self-introductions. Yeah. We'll go down the line, uh, Jeff, Joseph, and Steve, and thanks, Randy, for talking that. Dave, thanks, Harry. So, so in your bio, Harry, I seem to know that there was another SEAL who then became a doctor and is now an astronaut. So 
I think you still have a few more things if you want to keep up with the Davis. Well, 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 hey, I, I have three daughters, so <laughs> right. So I, I'm a girl dad. It's pretty tough, but yeah, that's he's he's overachiever. Hey, I, uh, but yeah, proud yeah. to be part of the community. My, my name is Jeff Worthington, uh, retired Army officer. Uh, I was a started out as an infantryman in the 82nd, and then transitioned to be a signal officer uh, through the, the rest of the course of my my career. A uh, number of different jobs. I've seen a lot uh, from the conventional special operations side, but uh, I consider myself a joint officer. So I may I may have worn an Army uniform, but I was a joint officer. Uh, served in the White House under uh, both Obama and the Bush administration. So I got to see a lot and experience a lot of uh, opportunities there. But finished up as the uh, the JSOC, the CIO for Joint Special Operations Command, or the J6 for uh, for JSOC, where, where cybersecurity then became. Uh, a very important component of what I thought my mission was because I could finally do something. I was not a consumer of the, the DOD cybersecurity. I actually um, could affect change, and so that became very important to me in ensuring that I could provide the services to the, uh, the commander globally. Uh, so I, I, I became very passionate about cybersecurity there and then came and joined CrowdStrike as an executive strategist, cyber advisor. I added the cyber advisor thing in there because I think it sounds cool uh, that I can talk about cyber stuff. But um, I really enjoy, we talk about what, what makes what's fun or what, what uh, interests you. I don't do AI for, for fun, sorry. Uh, I can't do that. I, I have no, uh, no letters at the end of my name up here. Uh, but what I do do for fun is, is help people. And whether that's service members getting out of the military or organizations, uh, companies, communities, uh, making themselves more resilient and, and more safe uh, through a better understanding and awareness of cybersecurity, th that's what I love to do. Uh, that's why I enjoy doing these things and doing these kinds of things up here on the panel. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you getting your steps in on your way back here uh, because it was uh, <laughs> definitely a walk. And, and I, I will tell you, I, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm impressed by the number of people that are here. Uh, and I really appreciate the fact that FCA has put us back in the back this time because there's not the, the hubbub of everything going on out there, and we can really have a good interaction. So thank you very much for sticking around today and joining us. Thank you, Jeff. And also, there's, there's plenty of seats back here. You're making us nervous. We think you might be running away, and you'd hurt somebody's feelings if you start walking away when, you know, like while they're talking. Um, but please, and uh, Joseph, if you could continue and self-introduce. Hi, uh, Joseph Schaefer. So I'm a professor at NDU CIC, as uh, Harry mentioned. Been there about uh, eight years or so. I'm retired from the Army also, did uh, comms, uh, IT, cyber, uh, have uh, acquired and run cyber in Kuwait and Iraq with some friends who are in the audience uh, in the White House and in the Pentagon. So, uh, and I've worked as a contractor with uh, Dell and with L3. Um, and just, just uh, really excited to be here. I teach a course uh, at, NDU, at NDU for national security and artificial intelligence. And it's, uh, it's one of our elective courses. So all the students uh, uh, from all the war colleges uh, can attend this course. So uh, National War College, Eisenhower School, um, our school, and the College of Information uh, uh, Security Affairs. And about, you know, about a third of our students are international students uh, as well. So we've got about a third U.S. Mill, a third international, about a third from other agencies. And as Harry said, our college in particular has you know, basically a free certificate programs and free master's programs if you're a, uh, a DOD employee, they're free, right? So it's a, it's a pretty, good, uh, pretty good deal, including with uh, cyber. So, hey, I, I'll tell you a little bit more about the course, uh, National Security uh, and Artificial Intelligence. Who's, uh, just a uh, quick uh, level setting, who's heard of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission? Yep. How about NSCAI, National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence? Right, so two congressionally chartered uh, co uh, commissions. I recommend their 1,000-page reports uh, to you, but uh, maybe you'll have a chance to summarize them uh, during our time together. Thanks. Hi, Steve Fail. I'm the security CTO for Microsoft Federal, and uh, my background is in software d development and, uh, and services design. So uh, at one point in my career, I was known as uh, that Microsoft guy that is like MacGyver. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I got all the crazy projects thrown to me. Apparently that's a career path to becoming a CTO is uh, MacGyver. So um, if you have, you know, can put together a rapid application design in 15 minutes and solve somebody's problem enough times in a row, uh, they give you a CTO title. Um, so uh, I guess about uh, five or six years ago, Microsoft started making a, a hard pivot into cybersecurity. 
And uh, so in that time frame, uh, from my work with the Department of Defense for several years, um, I uh, took on that cybersecurity remit. I was the first uh, strategist for uh, Microsoft Public Sector Security, uh, ended up doing security strategy for all of Microsoft US, built a fairly large business uh, out of that strategy. And uh, in more recent days, uh, for the last two years, I've been working directly with Microsoft Federal, uh, leading both our security business and our security technology strategy. Um, and the reason for that is because if, uh, you know, as I looked across the U.S. and all of the things that we could do and all of the good that we could uh, affect, um, really focusing in on the needs of the federal government uh, is a bit of a hack. Uh, to helping the rest of the world with cybersecurity. If we can get it right here, I love the, the Biden administration's language um, in EO 14028 that talks about government leading by example. Uh, we've absolutely seen the federal government leading, uh, leaning in and leading by example. And so that's why I came to the federal team is, is to spend time focused just on this unique space, unique challenges, but the lessons learned here are going to benefit the rest of the world. So appreciate all that each of you do every day. Great. So on the question, thank you. For... AI for cybersecurity. So what's it mean? Um, I think there's a lot of ideas out there, uh, but again, on time. So take Rorschach. I heard about that for the first time. I saw some heads nodding. Uh, Mike Tippin, another frogman, he's at Verizon, but saying if that's something that happens so fast, ransomware, that's kind of like the equivalent of a missile in cyberspace. Ransomware, breaking things. If you have not uh, looked at a, a, a book called Sandworm, Sandworm by Andy Greenberg about not Petya, you need to read it. The other thing is the ransomware. How can you take out 200,000 endpoints in four seconds? And if it hits your data center, you're screwed. So remember what I said about anticipation. But AI, though, things are happening. Things are bad. So what's it mean? Like, what difference does AI make for cybersecurity in this really dangerous world that we live in that's always evolving? Who wants to jump in first? I can I take a quick, st quick stab at that one? Absolutely, okay. awesome. Jeff. Thank you. And uh, I'll try not to use my volleyball analogy from, from or not volleyball, <laughs> my uh, uh, dodgeball analogy from last year. I, I liked it. Yeah, so so uh, I, I do think that you know, just like zero trust, like cyber a few years ago, uh, AI, ML has become this buzzword. Sprinkle some AI, ML on it, and you're all good to go. Um, and, and I will admit that uh, I'm going to give a big grand hand wave uh, at definitions. Uh, and I may not get it perfectly right, but I'm going to get it generally probably 80%-ish right or so. And, and so ML, machine learning, is a, a subset of, of AI. So they kind of go together, but, you know, it's not AI or ML. Uh, but AI is, you know, trying to, trying to be more intelligent, trying to be smarter on things. And, and ML really um, is very good at doing repetitive tasks over and over again, sifting through the noise uh, to free up time. So, so where I think AI for cybersecurity and why it's so important is you know the the four emails I got last week um, you know, telling me that my eBay account needed to be paid and I think Norton my Norton subscription was up it, it, it was not written properly it, it, it's still in today and it, it just kills me that today they can't get it right the, the English language translation was just very poor I, I and and we and my only hashtag shameless plug is my CrowdStrike coffee mug here but uh, you know we we in the company believe that uh, that. Chat, things like ChatGPT and AI are going to get very, very good at the the uh, the spear phishing, the phishing campaigns. They're going to get excellent, uh, and that's going to get identities. Eighty percent of your attacks are identity based, so that's going to get much more difficult to to figure out. Um, you know, likewise, you know, there will be the development of. Uh, malware, and, and there has been development of malware and code using things like ChatGPT um, to 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 shorten the time, to, to, to shrink the time it takes to either develop um, uh, new, new malware based on zero days that come out. Uh, and so it's inherent, it is table stakes that you know, your, your cybersecurity solution utilizes some sort of AI and ML in the defense because the adversary today is using it against you. And it's like, uh, and I was trying to think of the culturally appropriate way of saying, but it's like you know, a 20th century army going against an 18th century army. It's just, it's not the same. Uh, and if you're not doing, if you're not using the tool that the adversary is using, then, you know, you're fighting in, with 18th century defensive weapons against a 21st century adversary that is using, you know, automatic weapons. Uh, that's kind of that's my a, grand hand wave at it. That's a great point. I, I love history. I think of World War II. Remember the Enigma machine. The Nazis took a commercial product that was <coughs> cutting edge at the time, weaponized it, and it created a dilemma for us, for the allies. And the way we got around it is 
Uh, you had Alan Turing, who started a lot of all this, right, on computers, realizing that you needed a machine to beat a machine. But it was, as Jeff said, table stakes, right? And there's going to be a range, too. And for the next thing about what is AI for cybersecurity, the idea is that ro uh, robotic process automation, that's at one edge of the spectrum, or is it very, you know, high-end things that can be done only with cloud and uh, things like Platform One by the Air Force? Ma'am, thanks for being here. I'm so uh, so what, what is AI for cybersecurity in that context of table stakes, and what's your sense of, uh, what parts should we focus on? Uh, so well, Harry, did, oh, sorry. Joe, if you wanted to go first. So, go Harry, yeah, yeah, I would agree with you. I think the jury's still, on, still out on whether cyber or AI is going to be a net advantage for the pause, uh, uh, defense or for the offense. Who thinks it's going to enable better offense? Who thinks it's going to enable better defense? Yep. Okay, who thinks both, right? So both is <laughs> right, but I mean, who thinks offense is going to have the advantage in the, say, next uh, one to two years? Who thinks defense is going to have the advantage in the next one to two years? So, I mean, this is, I, I, uh, and again, you're about split on every question except when I said uh, both. Um, and so, uh, so I think this is really important. But it's also important, you know, we've got a lot of discussion recently. It's a very, very exciting. I mean, I've been doing AI for a long time. Uh, as an undergraduate, I, I did AI. And that was, you know, in the last century for sure, uh, before about half the audience was born. So uh, the... Um, uh, but we didn't have the compute, right? We didn't have the storage. We didn't have the data. We didn't have the compute. Like, neural nets are old, right? I mean, they're, they, they go like 70 years old, right? And so some of the concepts are there, but we just didn't have it. Now we have it. But what's going to be the advantage? The big discussion, of course, is GPT and uh, large lang language models, transformers in general, um, and has brought more attention to AI in a short period of time than, uh, than, than, I, than I would have imagined a year ago. And, and, and GPT's been around for about five years, right? Uh, 2018, 19, uh, 1, 2, you know, uh, 117 million parameters, 1.5 billion parameters, 175 billion parameters in GPT-3. And then what's GPT-4? Well, undisclosed, but if they're, they're going up by orders of magnitude. And, you know, as an AI you know, scientists, what are they doing? They're just fitting the curve, right? So if you think of it in two dimensions, all they're doing when they're trying to recognize things is, is, is fit a curve so that when they see another one, they can say, oh, that, that fits a curve. That's a cat. That's an alphabetic A, whatever. That's all they're doing. But with not with two dimensions, but, you know, <laughs> billions and billions of dimensions, and that's just, it's, it's mind-boggling when you think about it. And GPT, right, it's supposed to just, what's the next word? And we could talk about how this is in cybersecurity, like what's the next attack? Where is this thing going? How is it traversing through the network? Right, but what is the next word? But when you, see, that's all it does. It tries to figure out what the next word should be. But when you see it, you know, who's read like the technical reports on GPT-4? Anybody? Three. Good. So if you, you read this report and they give it a prompt, uh, you know, summarize Cinderella using uh, the letters of the alphabet, A to Z, no repeats. And it's like unbelievably poetic. And there's <laughs> no way any of these data occurred next to each other in their training data, right? I challenge you to go read that thing. You could just type GPT-4 Cinderella and you'll get it. But, you know, th th these are the kind of things that, that we can't really predict. But with cybersecurity, I think Steve's got the good examples of seeing some of this in action uh, on the defensive side. Go ahead. And as we move to, to Steve, I want to footstomp something that Joseph said. If you saw the CEDAW, uh, Mr. Martell's talk yesterday, right, he said that, uh, you have to remember, I wouldn't put ChatGPT in charge of something you don't know yourself or how to do, right? So that's how it's, it's a tool. And Chris Inglis, a couple of weeks ago, mentioned that the dangerous thing about uh, ChatGPT or generative AI is that it hallucinates, right? So we have to get after those problems and how you fix it. Hinton, Jeffrey Hinton was somebody who got all this stuff started when deep learning had an AI winner and at Carnegie Mellon, but then he went 
to Canada. He didn't want to contribute to war fighting. Um, people can have their opinion, but I think if we don't get after this in the right way, and Steve's going to jump in uh, with, with a view on this, then you let the adversary get there first, and history has shown us how that works. The Nazis got there with the Enigma machine. Thank goodness at Bletchley Park and Hut 6, we got to uh, the bomb. It's, a, it's with an E, but anyway. Uh, what do you think, Steve? What is uh, Thanks, AI Harry. for so, cybersecurity? And I'm going to walk over here to get some of my papers. It's, yeah, go for it. So. Uh, I've, been, I've been keeping watch on them for you. Good, good <laughs> cyber hygiene. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So uh, I promise I didn't change anything. Very in good the, isolation. In, yeah. there, no hallucinations <laughs> in, the, uh, in the documents as they're handed back. Uh, so first I want to thank Joseph for uh, reminding me not to disclose the number of parameters in GPT-4 uh, because I was about to do that. So, um, oh, wait, I take that back. <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> so I, I, I will say, you know, just at a, at a baseline, uh, AI for cyber, and I was having great discussion earlier, thank you, um, you know, around, uh, it, is AI really relevant for cybersecurity? Um, I think with with uh, all of the all of the items that Randall mentioned, I think the the more pertinent question is where is AI not relevant for cybersecurity? Uh, I think you covered pretty much all the disciplines there, um, and that's what we're finding as we're starting to work with these large language models. Uh, in in March, we uh, announced. Uh, in sort of a shocking way, Microsoft Security Copilot. Um, it is one of the fastest to market products we have ever developed at Microsoft. Uh, we are not known for release speed. Uh, you know, Windows Update happens once a month. Uh, you know, those types of things. So um, as we've looked at this transformative AI, the market is moving quickly. But it's because we finally achieved enough compute. We finally achieved a strategy to where the AI is becoming more valuable. And I think that's really the driver is... Is AI uh, going to help cybersecurity? Absolutely, and in increasing amounts as we come up with more valuable ways of creating that compute. You know, at, at a base layer, what is AI? Um, in most instantiations, uh, you know, maybe they're temporary, maybe they're permanent, but you come up with a model. And, and really, if you look at the character of cybersecurity, we are modeling and classifying behavior. Is this good behavior? Is this bad behavior? Do we understand the state of our network? These are questions that CISOs ask every single day. And so the nature of AI, the nature of machine learning, and generating a better model of explainability for the world is something that is fundamentally valuable to cyber defenders. And so as we invest in that, uh, not everything is going to require a gener generative model. Not everything is going to require um, you know, some old school PCA that you can run really fast on your phone uh, that you don't need a full data center for. Um, there's there are a lot of things we're going to learn. This field is going to continue to grow. But what we're seeing today is it is absolutely having an effect for cyber defenders. And not just detections. You know, many of our best detections inside of our products have AI in an analytic way finding detections. But in every single conference that I speak at for cybersecurity, the big question is what are you going to do with the people and the talent gaps? So we'll talk about that next. There's a ton of potential for AI there. Um, as we look at some of the examples, you know, our, our biggest challenge with Security Copilot, we named that extremely intentionally because we believe that essentially what is needed is a co-pilot. It is not in the driver's seat. It is not the decision maker. It is not the authority. But it is an incredibly helpful piece of portable, highly available intelligence. So what is the benefit of having these models? The benefit is um, you can extend the automation capabilities. So a lot of times the, the conversation between AI and automation sort of get intermingled. AI does not help you respond to things at scale. Automation does. AI helps you target properly so that your automation is doing good things at scale and doing beneficial things at scale. And so as we have great automation capabilities, our adversaries have great automation capabilities, AI is going to help us target those into the appropriate places. As we get better AI, things like GPT-4 models uh, that you can build on top of, that's really a platform and it's going to extend the scope of things that you can then automate. But the humans are still in the driver's seat. We're still making the relevant decisions. And this concept of responsible AI is, is really core at Microsoft to say, is this a, a legitimate fit for purpose use of this model? We have a model, but just because we have a model doesn't mean it's fit to solve problem X. And so that is something that, you know, as we look at the use cases, there are going to be appropriate use cases for the maturity level we're at. As the maturity gets better, there will be more use cases. And in terms of hallucinations, nobody likes bugs either. Like, hallucinations are not a feature. They're a bug, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to create better models. We're going to learn from it. We're going to inform those models. And we've already done that inside of Bing Chat. 
to give you options to have more precise answers or more creative answers. When it comes to cybersecurity, we're going to want the precision, right? So uh, I think that's sort of things that we're learning along the way. Thank you. So let's hey, Harry, go back to the adversary. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to I, I add to what Steve was saying as well. Um, and much like there's a human on our end, there, there's a human on the other end as, uh, also. So uh, at, at CrowdStrike, we, we, we say that, you know, you don't have an AI problem. You have an adversary problem. Mm -hmm. you, you, and we talk about, you know, hygiene, cyber hygiene. It still goes back to cyber hygiene. You still have to do the basics well. You're still going against a living, breathing adversary that has a motive and an intent and, you know, what they want to go after. So you still have to understand the person that is on the other end using the new AI tool uh, to go against you. So you, you can never discount knowing the adversary and knowing yourself and doing the basics well. Just, just knock out the basics initially, at least. Je Jeff, you read my mind. You anticipated there. Uh, on the adversary, what is it mean? What does AI mean for trying to break the defenses that we have up there? And we're not talking a lot about the cognitive side, but Randy, I'm, I'm thinking about your, you know, what you know about uh, insider threat. How, how is your adversary using this as well, uh, you know, to, to get in there? Who wants to jump in? Yeah, Randy? happy to jump in, certainly from the, the speed by which AI can assist with things like software development processes mm -hmm. and development of code that speed by which you can develop a framework for something that can be described appropriately through a chat GPT interface to target a particular area, target a particular sector, that type of veracity by which adversaries can use it should have the same approach from a defensive standpoint as well as you collect that information in your AI data repositories, that incident base that you can actually use to build upon where the adversaries may be targeting. Would you be susceptible through vulnerabilities? How can we, again, go from that scenario of a vulnerability to be able to remediate that as well? One of the interesting things that, that we've seen related to the software development is, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the amount of AI-assisted software development and the reliance upon AI to develop the software, there's a perception in a lot of the coders' perspective that we're developing secure software. And there's been a study, a great study done at Stanford recently looking specifically at the AI-assisted development tends to be less secure than any software developed just from the human perspective. So the perception that if your developers are developing from the positive side and they're assuming it's good, those researchers did a great job deciding through a number of series and a lot of case study foundational studies that it's actually not the case. So I think the speed by which the adversaries can use to develop the initial ways by which can the attack can occur that type of speed then can be applied on the defensive side as well, but the perception of developing something that is 100%, again, fill in 100% secure or 100% effective, that's where we still need to have that human in the loop when it comes to software development environments. Thank you. All right, so let's shift to people uh, or focus more on that workforce. Uh, Steve, I think you shared a, a, a story about someone going from zero to hero who was a beginner. It's not necessarily about replacing people, but getting people to understand how to fight, defend in a better way. So if zero to hero is possible in some ways, but then how about the heroes that are already there? Uh, how is AI, I mean, what does this mean for the workforce? Uh, yeah, great, great question. And, and this is something that, that we grapple with. Every organization grapples with the talent shortage in cybersecurity. Uh, even the fungibility of resources within cybersecurity. So I have a great analyst that does X, but it turns out they're, they're not a reverse engineering you know, guru or whiz, and I have one person in the shop, and they're my bottleneck. You, know, you showed the Phoenix Project earlier. You know, is, is your reverse engineer your bottleneck in your sock? Like, that's a good question. Um, and so you know, a lot of the early uh, AI capabilities that we developed were on the analytics side and really helped tier three to scale um, such that, you know, you could now stitch together multiple events and correlate them automatically so that you weren't taking up a tier three analyst time gathering all that intel. You give them some really good usable feedback, they validate it, and they move on. And that's great in detections, and that space is going to continue to grow. But what we've seen with specifically the generative models um, is that the ability to converse with a knowledge system um, that knows not just what is going on on the internet, not just what is going on in the realm of cybersecurity, as we look at multiple training contexts, but is fine-tuned with data from your environment, um, you now have someone, if they have domain knowledge, but they don't necessarily have the technical skills, they can still be highly effective. 
And so uh, we've done a lot of experimentation uh, with our security co-pilot um, where we're bringing in uh, folks that, that have no technical experience, they can't write code, they can't reverse engineer uh, an executable, but the co-pilot can do that for them and they're immediately productive. And so if you think about your tier one now punching, uh, you know, at a tier three level, uh, well above their weight, uh, weight class, uh, that's a really exciting development and that's something that I think everyone has been hungry for in the talent shortage. There was a great quote that I saw on LinkedIn. I wish I knew who originated it, um, but I'm just going to throw it out there and not claim it myself, is that AI is not going to replace your job. A person using AI will. Mm -hmm. um, thought that was a great quote. Um, and I think that speaks to, you know, a lot of the hesitation for adoption. We need to go the other direction. So, like, my kids are building AI. Uh, they're using the open AI service on Azure. Uh, they're, they're using AI. My daughter loves to write stories. She gets feedback on the stories about what she can improve, what the AI liked best, uh, what was a little confusing, right? Like, all of these things to help you cre be more creative faster, to put out quality work product faster. Um, even the tier three analysts with our generative AI, you know, the last thing you want to do after spending three months on an investigation is write the PowerPoint that explains everything that you had to do over the last three months, right? <laughs> like your tier three analyst wants to quit at that point. They're like, oh, I'll hand it up to somebody else. Well, nobody else understands what the heck you did, so you're going to have to write the PowerPoint. Um, but the CIO wants to know, so go ahead and write it. Uh, we now, you can ask, uh, you know, Security Copilot in Microsoft's, uh, you know, uh, new tool that we're, we're building. You can ask it to write the PowerPoint for you, and it will look at everything in your investigation, create the attack flows, uh, create the relevance, the charts, the timelines, all of that, and then the Tier 3 analyst validates it, and away you go, right? So, again, a copilot is not going to do the work for you, but it's going to help you do your work, and it's going to inform you on in it. Thank you. Yeah. I think uh, compliance, uh, GRC, compliance, uh, you know, DITSCAP, DICAP, security framework, these are going to be uh, big areas to, to take that, right? I, I told you the Cinderella. If it takes the Cinderella and turn it into 26 words, <laughs> it can take a lot of these reports, a lot of these repetitive reports. And you've got to write compliance reports on the same stuff for a handful of different uh, organizations who are interested in your in your results, so you know, I think a, a, a generative AI that has been you know some uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback in your domain and with your products is going to be a, a huge help uh, in that area. Now, now, how many people think that AI is going to take some jobs? Take some jobs. Take some jobs. Okay, I. I, I uh, I, I, I will agree with Steve that uh, a human with AI is going to take your job, but I think a human with AI is going to take a lot of jobs. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I mean, who was raised in the Rust Belt? Okay, I was, right? Mm -hmm. y y you know, the robots took those jobs, right? The robots took a lot of blue-collar jobs in the mills, in the steel plants, in the auto industry, and I think the AI has taken the jobs for a lot of you know, uh, a lot of a lot of knowledge workers, right? We've seen it already. They perform better now. There's conflicting evidence as to whether the uh, copilot-assisted coder has more secure or less secure. I've heard it both ways from members of this panel just this morning. But it's going to get better over time. These bugs are going to get fixed. We're on GPT. Are we on GPT 75? No, we're on GPT-4, <laughs> right? So uh, I, I think, uh, but this is not to be scared. I mean, we've had these revolutions before. The industrial revolution, the automation revolution, the uh, uh, industrial robots. And we, but we have to think about safety. We, we can't slow down, though, right? The Chungwo Ren, the Chinese communists, are not going to slow down. And honest to God, we can't afford to get behind in this area. But we've got to be safe about it. We've got to be safe. We can have a Formula One car, and if it's on a dirt road, it's no good, right? It's, it's not going to be good. We've got to put the roads. We've got to put the guardrails. We've got to put the seat belts. But we, but we absolutely, I don't think, uh, can slow down. So, so I'm going to agree with Steve on, on all the training parts, uh, so I won't belabor that. I, I will add that I, I believe um, that it will shorten the training cycle in getting that, that initial guy or gal trained up. You know, based on other analysts that have better training or more training, you should do the following kind of thing. So I think it will upskill the workforce faster. 
Um, what, it, when I was in JSOC, uh, we, we used the legacy signature-based systems that, you know, that they're using. Uh, and I had a really smart Air Force officer that said, so I need to bring something else in. There's this AI thing going on. Now, this back in 2018 or so. And uh, I'd like to field this other solution. And so we fielded another solution, another tool uh, on our network, immediately caught uh, things that our, our legacy solution was not catching. One of them happened to be a Bitcoin miner that was mining Bitcoin on our network and, uh, and a number of other things. Uh, I believe that you should always hunt your network. If you can't get past... Uh, you know, just vulnerabilities or you know tracking down the next CVE you're never going to get that team to start hunting your network so you have to use AI to free up some people uh, to, to allow them to do higher level tasks that, that the AI and the ML just you know isn't doing uh, and allow them to hunt your network I would never have been able to free up people to hunt the network to find the Bitcoin miner because I was doing everything the way it had been done for I don't know how many years uh, so, so I think not only does it upskill your workforce and help in the training, but it also allows you to find those things and to free people up to do some tasks that you just have never gotten to. Um, because I was never confident in what my real vulnerabilities, what, what my risk score really was. So when you use AI for things like predicting, um, based on what is going, and the data set is extremely important, you know, based on what I am seeing across the globe in your vertical or um, you know, with, with your network and the vulnerabilities that you have, these are the three things you must patch right now. Uh, so they will really help you hone in on that rather than me who is, hey, let's patch the highest vulnerability so DISA stays off our back. You know, uh, let's patch one with the, that gets us the lowest score. Let's, and we were just shooting in the dark because we had no one helping us and really refining our sight picture and then freeing up my people to go do other things that, that we just couldn't get to yet. Yeah, I love it. Jeff just mentioned hunting. That's a great segue to go to zero trust and zero trust architecture, right? And if you think of an analogy back in time, hunting dogs, how better were dogs going to replace human beings hunting or trying to defend where you live? No, but it's very important. There's an interesting book by a lady named Darling called The New Breed. It's about what our history with animals can teach us about our future with robots. And so back to cybersecurity and zero trust, the principle that you should never trust always verify, right? But what does that mean for architectures? By the way, culture and systems for how we work is what DevSecOps is about. If you want a crash course on it, this book, and come up and you know, see it later and feel the heat coming off of it from where you are, right? Amazing book. Uh, and it, it's built on what happened with Toyota production system, taught by a guy named Deming on how you create value by unleashing human beings to be able to be nimble and to adjust not to some theory of the future. We're not talking waterfall. We're past the days of building battleships or systems uh, where they go out for 40 years. We're actually hunting today on these systems that we build. And let me say operational technology, because we don't want to skip that. How do you protect that? But let's go into zero trust architecture. And please, somebody mentioned something about uh, Cloud One, or if you're in the Navy, uh, Black Pearl, but how you can build on Platform One, Cloud One, Iron Bank. Anybody know that? Who here knows what Iron Bank is in Cloud One? I just want to see a hand. Okay, good. Wow, this side of the room is strong. It's because you're sitting over there, ma'am. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so zero trust architecture. What, what's AI going to mean for that? If you don't mind me jumping in, uh, if you can be maybe 15 seconds to go back to the comment before, I agree 100% with the learning opportunities AI can provide. But as I was introduced as inside a threat is my area of expertise, Think about the, not necessarily the malicious insider, but the accidental mm. non-malicious insider when you use AI to take my investigator notes, my specific product specifications, and build that PowerPoint. Now, is your intellectual property now possibly part of other training sets that would be potentially outside of your organization? So just want to kind of caution that the ability to use that should be authorized by your organization to make sure that you're protecting the key assets in your organization. Now, when it comes to insider threat and zero trust, certainly one of the core foundations of that is really identity and identity management and verification of identities. And that's the key when it comes to insider threat detection is confidently saying this is who they say they are, but also at the same time where AI can help is from the anomaly detection from an insider perspective. As we earlier said, 
what is a normal or presumed set of good activity when an individual is identified through identity management, and AI can certainly help from those anomaly detection capabilities. Again, when you look for insider threats, the malicious inside of the accidental, there's a things confidently that the anomaly detections can be helped and assisted by AI generative technology that can help that analyst prioritize what's most likely to be concerning from an organization. So I'd like to start maybe with AI can certainly help with identity management and then very quickly, obviously the anomaly detection from an inside of threat perspective. Thank you. Sure. Zero trust. I'd love to follow on to that. Uh, also, just because you make a really great point, Randall, uh, any of the things that I said you should do, you should not do with chat GPT, and you should not <laughs> do with Bing chat, right? Like, your intellectual property is your intellectual property, so, um, you know, from a standpoint, and definitely national security, like anyone NSS, uh, like, please don't put that data into those public systems. Um, but that's why, from a responsible AI perspective, when we build our products, we say, your data is your data and you go ahead and generate that PowerPoint, all of the data, all of the input stays within your organization, uh, is not used to train anything else, right? So that's a tenant of our open AI service, that's a tenant of all of our co-pilots. Uh, but the problem is with all the hype around the co-pilots, someone's gonna go to a public service and try to do the same thing. So yeah, absolutely recommend against that. From a zero trust perspective, um, I think one of the really exciting things, um, and I had mentioned this to, to, to Harry and I think someone else uh, prior to the session is, that we're, we sort of accidentally stumbled on something that AI is really good at. So my team was doing some R&D. We had some early models that we were testing uh, with, a, with a customer in the federal space. And uh, it did a really great job. And we found some software supply chain attacks and we found some really interesting things. Um, and it was hunting really well. Um, so we got excited and we said, hey, the great thing about models are they're portable. It wasn't built on that customer's data. Um, so let's take it, it's portable, we'll try it and enrich it with another customer context separately and find out what's going on over there. The model found absolutely nothing. Uh, we were completely embarrassed and uh, we said, oh, well, you know, maybe, you know, this isn't fairy dust. Um, and I said, hold on, let's find out why. Yes. Um, are the adversaries not here? Um, is it that the model was, you know, trained based on assumptions and then worked in one environment, didn't work in another? It turns out uh, those classes of attacks and those adversaries that were found in the first environment didn't exist in the second environment. So we, we looked at it and we had to do some manual hunting to validate, right? Trust, trust but verify. We had the hunters go in and validate. In fact, the adversaries were not there. Turns out the reason was that organization was further along on their zero trust maturity journey than the first organization was. And there were whole classes of attacks that just didn't exist in the environment. And so we started thinking about the model and we said, okay, maybe this is a good hunting model, but maybe it's an even better model of zero trust maturity because now we can find, you know, is an organization based on the classes of attacks that we're seeing, what is their implicit uh, level of maturity on zero trust? And so an absolutely fascinating area of research, we're working with a number of uh, intelligence and defense organizations on that right now, um, but that is a use case for AI and zero trust because one of, the, one of the hardest things, and I've talked with the NSC about this multiple times, is how do we measure progress on zero trust? Um, and uh, and I love, uh, I think Colonel Kipe is doing a presentation on zero trust right now. I won't talk too much about it or some of you will run over there. Um, but, you know, one of the things that Randy Resnick and Colonel Kipe uh, love to say is that uh, zero trust is stopping the adversary. <laughs> you know you've done it right when the adversary stops. And so uh, we've, we've really seen that to be the case with some of our AI models. And I think that's a, a rich area for additional research. So we have time for questions. Please join me in thanking the panel for this part of the presentation. So uh, if someone else wants to follow up on Zero Trust, but while we get our first person to come up, if, if you don't mind, we've got a microphone. Uh, love some questions uh, because we'd rather have hear from you on a question rather than have me, you know, talk up here. But And by the way, I've got, a, I've got a gift for the first person to ask a question. What paper am I holding up? It's called, uh, let's see, Attention is All You Need. This kind of got things going. Uh, you know, with where the advancements with chat GPT, generative AI, there's a breakthrough uh, that happened with this type of thinking. This is a very important paper. I see. see that's, a, that's a good paper. There you Definitely go. Definitely worth a read. Uh, you, sold. <laughs> Got a winner right there. <laughs> please, pa pa pass this. Excuse me, sir. Uh, could you pass that to him, please? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I have a question around data sets and where you get your original data sets to build these uh, products and solutions from. And how do you keep out long-term adversaries from poisoning the well of data? Right now, we know we're building all of these data sets, and we're going to use them in the future. 
currently, if I was, say, an adversary, I'd be slowly poisoning the well of, of knowledge until I had an attack for, you know, three to five to ten years later. Is there any, any uh, sort of plan of uh, protecting and, and verifying the, the data sets as you gather them from the wild? So I'll, uh, I'll take that one to start. I'll try to be brief uh, to allow plenty of time for, for others to follow up. Uh, so a couple of things. Anytime you can force an adversary to boil the Internet, uh, it's a good day, right? So like if you look at DDoS, um, if we can force the adversary to have to DDoS the entire Internet, that's a good day for defenders. Um, if we look at the same thing with AI, like please waste your time seeding things for 10 years from now. Uh, based on things that you want us to believe in that point of time. We'd love for adversaries uh, in nation states to do that. Um, it's not going to work. And here's why it's not going to work. is because uh, the outer layers have more sway over the outputs than the inner layers. And so when you look at stack models, layered models, we do fine tuning. It is super easy to find those things and it's super easy to tune them out. Uh, because uh, one thing that generative AI models are really great at is finding bias. Um, and so when you find sort of, you know, split decision, um, diverging from a norm, uh, it's really easy to pick out in a model and you can declare that bias. Um, or if you know that it's adversarial, you can just filter it out. So uh, if, you know, if there's a, a bug request, I would love, you know, if there's a CVE, someone spends 10 years trying to develop a CVE and we can wipe it out in 30 seconds with a bug fix, I think the defenders actually have an advantage there. Thank and you. I, Not everybody wants to get up, so raise your hand if you want to go next and I'll bring this to you. And, and I will not answer for what data, what external data sets CrowdStrike uses, but what we do have are now 13 years, 13 years of uh, telemetry data from, you know, uh, endpoints across the globe that we do use to train our models. So it's continually being retrained by the telemetry that comes in. I think it's two trillion events a day or something like that that comes in that helps to refine that, that model internally in addition to other external data sets that, uh, that are used as well. Hey, as, as, uh, as someone else coming up, uh, I don't know if we're going to hit it, and I hate to jump in here, Harry, but I, I know someone is thinking about a question. They're going to walk up here. There you go. Um, and speaking of data sets, you know, when we talk about the C-suite or the executives, I think the, the problem we have with senior leaders is they don't know the right questions to ask. Uh, and so when someone says, hey, we got AI models in our, uh, in our cybersecurity system, we're good, and the, and the boss, the, the, the CEO says, okay, good, we're using AI. But, you know, what, what is the size of the data set you're using? Where are you getting the data sets that are you? So the, the additional questions behind, we're using AI ML, I think the executives need to know to ask uh, rather than just being sold a, you know, a bill of goods on we're using AI. If you're using AI with 10 parts of data in it, but it's still AI, that is not the same as using you know, petabytes of data or years of data that's really helping refine that picture. And one thing on data, why the data? We didn't really drill down as much as we might have on leaders. And so the whole why part of this, and so when you're looking at how you're going to get the information, by the way, on great power competition, coming back to this decisive decade, trying to make sure that we win, uh, the adversary, Communist Party of China has access to data in a different way than we do. It's safe to say that, in a different way. So I went to law school after being in the SEAL teams, and how we deal with privacy absolutely right for us I've got my what am I reaching for my constitution with me right so we have to account for civil liberties so thoughts on that you just want to make sure we we, we mentioned something about that so I experimented with having the uh, you know but I, I, I may be I don't know I mean it's a little bit too pushy please somebody else have any questions yes thank you I have some thoughts on that, but go ahead, Joseph. Well, that might be what Taiwan's all about, right? So uh, just <laughs> just putting it out there. Go ahead, Steve. I, I, I think compute is, with some of the new forms of, of generative AI, compute is a barrier to entry. And so uh, it, it's not required for all AI to have extremely high levels of compute, right? But um, for generative AI specifically, we're, which is where we're seeing a lot of innovation, you need a whole data center. Um, like the, the price tag on training GPT-4 is extremely high. Not a lot of organizations have that in their R&D budget. I mean, about how much? 
<laughs> I can't disclose how much, uh, but I can disclose that you know we've committed ten billion dollars of investment to open AI so that they can do things like that. Um, that's not an investment most organizations can make. But how we're looking at it is not some you know, uh, some firewalled thing for Microsoft. We're looking at this as a platform that everyone can build on. So let us train the hard part of the model, fine tune it for your use case, and it's your organization's model. You pay just the incremental price of fine tuning. Let us do the heavy lift for you in partnership with OpenAI. So um, while it is prohibitive to, to generate a new core model, uh, the innovation and the number of apps and the number of use cases that spawn off of it, we're looking at this as the next platform. Like, this is going to be bigger than Windows uh, in terms of platform capability. That's how we're looking at AI. Mike, so one way to think about this also is self-driving cars, getting the level five autonomy. That is a really big deal. It's going to have billions of dollars, already does, behind it. Think about the compute that's required for that. We haven't mentioned, by the way, the compute that may not be necessary because... You have cloud, and also because you have the right connectivity. So chipsets, very important. Joseph made a reference to uh, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC, but it's part of a supply web. Think of what the Dutch do, ASML. Okay, so... That part's classified. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. So you're neither my friends or my adversaries. It doesn't matter. What, so what I'd say on compute is JADC2, edge computing, battlefield Internet of Things, operational technology. So there's a balance, right? Balance of how much compute you need for what purpose and where. And if you want to see the challenges of operational technology, start talking about protecting the electricity grid. That matters. And the telecom system that goes there, there are 16 critical infrastructures that we consider. They're not all, all the same. Telecom's kind of like the brain. The heart is like the power systems. And water, uh, got three days if you don't do that. So uh, thanks, Mike, for that question. But on self-driving cars, that's a big societal effort that's going to really push advancements forward. And because I'm, you know, professors and jo Joseph, another paper here, this is by Carver Mead. If you have not, if you've heard of neuromorphic computing, anybody here, neuromorphic? It's different. It's, it's something to consider. It's a little bit more bespoke, and, but it's actually when you put compute and storage in the same place. There are efforts that will fit into the ways we make chipsets uh, now, but there are some exquisite applications that go into the future. But think about your brain. Always think about how your brain works. If I give you water, for 30 days you could compute one of the most advanced you know, processors out there, but it can't beat robotic uh, you know, processes that are in AI for certain purposes, but it's limited. So, hey Harry. Yes. So, so not a cybersecurity thing, but you were talking cloud and platform one. Yes. I, I I think it is imperative that and and compute. I think it's imperative that we enable our service members to utilize the compute power of things like platform one or JWCC to um, to develop solutions that answer a commander's uh, question today, not ten years from now in a program. But, but use the compute power and the data sets that are in the DOD and AI algorithms and models so that a commander can get a decision made faster because that's how you get inside the adversary's OODA loop is by taking advantage of all of those things combined. Until we empower our soldiers and service members to do that on the edge, we will continue to be 10 years too late and three programs behind. So it's bringing Sorry. us full circle back to time. Uh, we've got time for one or two more questions. Uh, yes, sir. Well, so quantum has a lot of potential, all right? Uh, uh, tremendous. Uh, he, he had, uh, how can quantum be used? Yeah, that's Thanks, Gary. So, how, uh, so in, in several, uh, several approaches, right? One is solving different sorts of problems than we do with our binary computers, right? Practically instantaneously, like most encryption, right, is based on, uh, y you know, solving um, uh, integers, right, uh, uh, prime numbers. So 
and quantum could really affect that. There's also the entanglement and instantaneous communication, a bunch of different things. But I think the jury's still on, out on how that will and when that will uh, 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 happen. Although I think that the quantum is, is closer than folks thought a couple of years ago, just as you know, this sort of large language model has caused a lot of awareness to happen. I think quantum, I think we're going to get to an inflection point quite soon on quantum. And Gary, to follow up, there's a different way on quantum, and I thank Randy for this, uh, saying that uh, you can, actually you said it beautifully, uh, attackers are using AI to build better uh, attacks and even breaking quantum-resistant encryption. So that's back to the point of how can AI be used, right, to go after whatever systems we have in place. And uh, could you pass that to Gary, please? Let's give him a... I, uh, I think it's a whole other panel's worth of conversation, yeah. um, but I'll try to bring that question back to AI. I think we use AI to error correct our quantum computers. Um, so in, in Microsoft, uh, I'm a sister division of the one that I'm in uh, develops our quantum computing, and, uh, and we've actually used it to denoise qubits. Um, so there is some, some benefits of AI to quantum as well, and then the adversarial example that you mentioned. But I think it, the reassuring thing is, are there going to be new types of attacks or are there going to be new problems? Absolutely. Can we look around one corner? Yes. Can we look around two corners? Probably not. Um, but what I have a lot of faith in and what I've seen with these innovations coming along is that the tenants and the hard work we've put into cyber where we are will carry forward and that learning is absolutely portable into the future. The specific activities we take may look different, but the principles are sound. So I get a lot of questions around you know, AI fraud and abuse and adversary use of AI to generate malware or whatever else. Like, this is another area of please sign in to a massive compute cluster with your identity before you try to generate malware. Like, that is a good problem for cyber defenders, right? Um, so, like, we've been dealing with fraud, abuse, all of these things, you know, outside of quantum, outside of AI. We have robust programs, robust principles. We're working with NIST on these things. We're going into it clear-eyed. And so I think all of the expertise that all of you have built up is entirely portable and applicable to these new domains as they show up. Yeah, and the, yeah, the Nigerian prince was uh, predates uh, cybersecurity, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, and yet... People still fall for it, right? And I think uh, Jeff pointed out some challenges with that earlier. But some more good news, and I think Steve just reminded us of some really good news. And we talked about, you know, compute and storage, but data is the other uh, uh, big thing. And we had a question about how do we trust the data. And there's a lot of, there, in some, especially in some of the national security uh, um, channels, there's people, oh, I mean, who's got more people, the United States or China? China, okay, this was an easy one. But it's not just the United States versus China. It's the United States and our friends, people who, who value the same thing, a lot of similar things that we do. And, and in, in that scale, I, I think we win, right? We win with our, with our, it's not just us. It's us and our allies and friends and partners. Thank you. On that note, when we go to war, we go to war with our friends. Thank you all for being part of this, and please join me again in thanking our panel.